Hi everyone and welcome to today and I'll just share my screen as well so I can go through my slides with you. Okay, so yes, I'm Linda Marshall from Life Mastery Now and thank you for the lovely introduction there, Ash. Um, so today I want to share with you how to build a better you and how to be more adaptable and responsive to change. Okay, so I have got a little Einstein quote there. I love Einstein. Um, so Einstein says, the world as we have created it is a process of our thinking. It cannot be changed without changing our thinking. So we create our reality in the moment, in the now, by our thoughts. Okay. So what you will learn here today is how the mind works, an insight into yourself and others, and an opportunity for change. So let's begin our journey. Everything in life is a choice. And I want you to realize that you're in charge of those choices. I want you to do life versus life doing you. So if you've all watched the movie Sliding Doors, you, depending on what path you choose, you can have a completely different outcome. Um, so we want to choose healthier, better choices, or you can exit or bug out of life. But people that have come to me that have done that, they don't find that, you know, that's really the best option. They're quite miserable. So we'd like to choose a good choice for yourself. So showing up today is awesome and being here. So good choice. So how the mind works, another Albert Einstein, I told you I liked him. So he says we're boxed in by the boundary conditions of our own mind and our own thinking. So what I want to do with you today is to stretch those boundaries, stretch that box or that comfort zone that you're currently living in so we can think outside the box. To do that, I'd like to share with you that there's two types of people in this world. Now, the first person, well, he stagnates and shrinks. And the second person expands and grows. So let's explain them in a little bit more detail. So the first person, as he heads towards his retirement, he or she, his outlook shrinks and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. We call this person $300 a week, bowls and death. Why? Because they usually get $300 a week from the pension. They play bowls and then they die. They get very set in their ways. Their minds are very set. They don't have an open mind. They're very cynical and they can become very negative. They don't realize that it's meant, you're meant to grow and expand. The other thing they often do is buy things or do things, spend money, materialistic things to make themselves feel happy. And they don't realize that the uh, happiness comes from within. The journey is an inside job, not an outside one. The second type of person, however, as they head towards their retirement and get older, the opposite happens. Their outlook expands and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, so I say, well, which type of person do you want to be? Hopefully the second one. We're meant to grow and evolve and change. That is how we're built and designed. However, typically our systems resist the change. So I'm just going to show you on this diagram, these little red lines on both of the diagrams represent your boundary conditions. And that's what Einstein says we're boxed in by. So you can be sat in your comfort zone before this red line and you want to move to the next level. But this is where sometimes we feel like we're working harder, not smarter, because our system is designed to keep us stuck, keep us in our comfort zone. So let me give you an example of that. Um, by explaining the two types of the brain. So you've got your critter brain, which is your reptilian brain. That part of the brain only cares about longevity of life, not quality of life. So that's your amygdala, reptilian critter. So that part of the brain, when it goes off, you're in your fight or flight response, all right? And so because we feel that in the body as well, we don't feel like we want to move through to that next level that we, we want to because our system wants to keep us where we are in our comfort zone. Then we have our cortex brain and that part reasons, blames, justifies, makes excuses and tells a story of why you should stay there. So it's really good. You know, it, we're set up to fail sometimes, but once you know how this works, we can change the programming. So you may be there, then you want to grow involved to the next level and the next level. And we butt up against these boundary conditions. And so what I do as a mindset specialist is help recode in the brain it to be survivable so that your system is happy for you to move through those layers, okay? So an insight into yourself and others. So a Charles Darwin quote there, it is not the strongest of the species that survive, 
nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. Okay, and as we've had so much change lately with COVID and just in general in life, I don't know about you, but I've got two teenage daughters and things are changing and hormonal in my house all the time. And I need to adapt to change just in normal day-to-day -day life, let alone all the change that's been thrown upon us over the last few months. And what I wanna teach and share with you is how to be more adaptable and responsive towards that change. And it, we want you to um, not just survive, but to thrive, okay? So, also now I'm gonna share with you the roundabout of life. Now this is the best way I could put this into a teachable format. When I learned about this is what we do as a human being and this is how our brain functions, I was relieved. I thought, oh my God, thank God it's not just me. I'm actually normal. So I'd like to say welcome to humanity because we're all masterfully messed up, me included. <laughs> so let's go through it. And the other thing I've got there in the bottom left-hand corner is you'll do this until the day that you die, okay? So learn to feel comfortable feeling uncomfortable and it's going to feel uncomfortable when you push past those boundaries that's normal so be okay with it so let's go into what phase one looks like so phase one is where you're going through life and everything is fine and then you hit a trigger something happens now often you may know what that trigger is or you may not know but what I will tell you is nine times or 99.9% .9 of the time, your problem is never your real problem. And that'll explain itself later. All you know is you're going through life, everything's fine and you hit a trigger. Then that moves you into phase three, phase two. Phase two is then I'm starting to go downhill. So I've hit a trigger, I'm starting to go downhill. What does that look like? We start losing motivation. We start getting angry or frustrated or we start procrastinating or making poor decisions and not making any decisions at all. So that will then move you into phase three, which is a stuck or a baseline state. Now, without life mastery, we can have the big highs and the big lows. And if we look at that baseline, it's quite low. And the baseline states can be things like hopelessness, worthlessness, despair, depression. It could be overwhelmed, stress, or you're just stuck or lost. So it depends how low you go and how long you stay there varies. But with Life Mastery, I teach you how to go up and plateau, up and plateau. You'll still do the emotions because we're emotional beings. We can't avoid that. But you're just not going to have the extremes. The other thing to note, when you're in phase three, the brain is offline, okay? Google's not connected. And so the internet's not there. And so that's when we're in our fight or flight response. And we don't think you'll have access to the logic brain to know what to do. So what I do in my coaching practice is teach people tools and techniques that they can use to know where they are on the roundabout, become very familiar and have conscious awareness, but also tools that help get them out of, of that state as well. And they're tools I'm talking that are like 30 or 60 seconds, not an hour, not 20 minutes, because people, we live busy lives. We're not gonna, you're not gonna do something for an hour, already know that. So I'm always about fast tracking you and working smarter, not harder. So using tools, understanding where you're at, we'll move through to phase three into phase four, where you regain hope and everything starts going well again. And we'll do this over and over and over again. So we may as well just photocopy our life and live it because that's what we do anyway. <laughs> and that's what happens with how the brain stores information too. So hopefully you're finding this relatable and you're now realizing that you're only human, that we all do this. The thing is, we can't always see our own blind spots. So when they hit that trigger point, when I explain a few other things, you'll understand why. And that's why I have a coach because I can't see my own blind spots, even though I know all this stuff. It's just how we're made. So the top five areas of life mastery. So generally we find our clients wanna be happier, healthier, have peace of mind, good relationships and be reasonably prosperous and financially independent. That's what most people are looking for. So the Life Mastery Success Target looks at the five key areas of life mastery and how you do one thing is how you do everything. So if you've got an issue in one area, it can ripple into the other. And if a piece is missing, it's like a pie. If a piece is missing, you're no longer a whole. So we look at a holistic approach. So with those five key areas, we've got self-mastery, we've got relationship mastery, money mastery, business and career mastery, and health mastery. 
Inside of that, we have emotional mastery. We've all heard about emotional intelligence and awareness. It's a lot more spoken about now and mindfulness and things like that. And I will tell you, just because you're 50 or whatever age you are, you don't necessarily have emotional intelligence or maturity. That comes from our patterning and our conditioning. So it is a skill that we need to learn. That gives you life mastery. Life mastery is all about managing and mastering your emotions, updating the programming in the mind in all of these five key areas. So the opportunity to change, you can't change what you don't acknowledge, okay? Again, if you don't see it, you, don't, you can't change it. You don't even know that it's there. And so what I do for people is help reveal what they're not seeing, okay? Um, the same as with my own coach with myself, I can't see my blind spots. They help present to me and see what I can't see. So if you don't change what you don't acknowledge, you can't change it. So good old Dr. Phil, it's about the only thing I got from him <laughs> that I thought was really useful. <laughs> and now we're going to move into the life mastery success model. So I want to have personal financial wealth and well-being. That's what most people say that they want. And they want to have that permanent change, success and fulfillment to live the life that you desire, that you're wanting. And so we'll look at these five key masteries in a little bit more detail. So we've got the self. The self is the identity, the who am I? Who am I now my kids have gone to school? Or who am I now that my kids have left school? Or who am I now that I've gone back to work? Or who am I now that I'm 50 years old and I've only got X amount of years to retire and I'm not where I thought I would be financially? So a lot of people from the age of 35 to 55 typically ask these questions. We get more reflective the older that we get and we question where we're at because we're thinking, oh, the time is ticking. I've only got X amount left and I want to retire. I want to do this or I want to do that. Or who am I? You might have gone through a divorce or some kind of significant emotional event and you're like, well, who am I now? So that reinvention of oneself, that transformation of oneself, that's certainly an area that we look at. Then we have relationships. So relationships have a really big impact in our life, okay? And if I look at your most intimate relationship, your, your intimate partner is your greatest teacher. So don't shoot the messenger because they're there to teach you. There's a quote that says, we don't live in a rewarding or punishing universe. We live in a reflective one. So they are often reflecting back at you an area that you can grow and that you can change. You may not like it, you may not want to hear it, but often they know you quite well. Or if it's something that you're not needing to work on, how do you work with that situation if, if that's arising and it's causing conflict? Also, there's relationships with your children or your family, your parents. They always have lots of little stories attached to them. And also with our work colleagues or our employees or people we do business with. So it is quite a big subject and navigating healthy ways to have relationships is something we do. Then there's money. Whether we're rich or poor, we always want more. Why? It's our currency for living. And so it can be really stressful without it and it can be a lot more fun with it. It funds our dreams and our lifestyle. And there's a lot of belief systems that we have attached to money, all right? So it's something that I end up working with with everybody at some point in time because it affects how we live, it impacts how we live. Then there is business and career. So a lot of people here today are business owners and some of you may have a career and you may or may not be happy in that career. So we have processes to line you up, to match you with, well, what is it that you want to do if you want to reinvent yourself? What, what would it, you be good at doing? Are there anything, is there anything stopping you or blocking you from having that? And with a business, have you bought yourself a job? You know, does your, your lifestyle fit into your business or does your business fit into your lifestyle? We want that work-life balance. You don't want to buy a job. You want to have a lifestyle. So how can it work in harmony with each other? And look, there's all sorts of different things around business that you can look at and how you can grow and expand to, to upskill as well. And then we have health. So health, we look at a few different things under that banner. So health can be things like disease. So disease in the body is dis-ease in the body. And so a lot of research has been done. We look at the holistic approach at Life Mastery Now, and we look at, you know, there's studies and things that have been done for things like cancer or down to back pain or, or stomach issues and things like that. There's a lot of unresolved emotional issues that we've never dealt with that can be harboring on the inside that can cause that disease. So we have a cause and an effect. The effect may be that we have a cancer or a backache or whatever it might be, but have we also looked at the medical side? Great. 
and this side of it as well, because your body knows how to heal itself. So we also want to look at what are those things that we may have never worked on and we've held down like a beach ball that have to pop up and pop out can show out in that way and manifest in that way in the body. So that's something we look at because your body does speak your mind. We can also look at things like weight loss. So weight loss, people can do the yo-yo. So we can look at how do we maintain that. And then there can be things like sport or peak performance where I've worked with people that play high level or professional golf, for example, and they want to work on an aspect of their game, like chipping or putting or something like that. And there might be an area or it might be the crowds of people that are watching them and things like that. So there's lots of different things that come under the health banner as well. So how do we get the big question to have that personal financial wealth and well-being to have the permanent change, success and fulfillment to live the life that you want? Hopefully you're curious by now. So I go through a to have that what we call the logical levels of change or the neurological levels of change so it's a little model that we go through where i'm going to go through each of these in detail and if you've got a pen or paper handy or just just noting to yourself as i go through these i want you to think about how do these relate to you in your life okay because we're all human we all do all of these things, but as I'm explaining them, see how they relate and resonate with you and maybe where you can make some changes. Because remember, you can't change what you don't acknowledge. So we're gonna put a flashlight of the focus on some of these areas. So the first one is environment. Environment is where you spend your time and who you spend it with, because we become what we hang around. We all know at school, if we hung around the wrong crowd, we became them or we get tarred with the same brush if we didn't, you know. So also it's something that you are very familiar with. So your surroundings, and Einstein says we get boxed in by those boundary conditions. So our comfort zone wants to sit where it does feel familiar and comfortable. Then I've got your workplace there. So your workplace, if you've got a messy desk, how do you feel? How do you function? So thinking some people work from home and a lot of us have worked from home lately, um, but if you've got a messy house or a messy desk or the environment that you operate from, you're not very efficient or effective. So maybe you might need to have a little bit of a spring clean or a look at that, that area. So the other thing my mum used to say growing up is that if the house was messy, if she made her bed and her bedroom seemed tidy, even if she felt chaotic during the day, she'd walk in there and she could reset because it was one room she just could connect to that was tidy. So your environment affects how you operate. And also it is everything that makes up your surroundings, including you. So who are you showing up as? Or who do you need to be to have what you want? And sometimes the environment, like if you wanna learn and grow and expand, because of the tall poppy syndrome, sometimes you, know, you wanna share with your friends and your family, but they may not have the knowledge and expertise on the area that you wanna learn about. So you might need to put yourself in that environment to learn from an expert. So hopefully some of this you're resonating with. Okay. Don't know why this isn't clicking. <laughs> Getting on to the next slide. I've got some tech issues. Might need some help. So for some reason, it's not uh, clicking to the next one. Excuse me a moment. Just don't know why it's not clicking to the next slide. Excuse me, everyone, for a moment. I just need to stop share. Hmm. Oh, actually, it was that one. It's really bizarre. Bear with us for a moment, everyone. Hopefully you're cleaning up your messy environment. <laughs> I'm cleaning up mine. <laughs> Maybe we need to do that one, yeah. We'll go to behaviors now, which is, hang on. That one, yep. Let's see if that works. All right, I'll just see how this goes and go from 
Okay, cool. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for your patience. Technology, hey, not my favourite. <laughs> Something I'm learning. And here we are into behaviours, so don't freak out. <laughs> Go with the flow. <laughs> All right, so behaviours. Behaviours are unconscious strategies that we run. So I've got their anger, frustration or depression. And because they're unconscious, and I've also got there that they're automatic, that's why someone can go from zero to 100 really quickly because it's an unconscious strategy that just happens like that. The other thing I've got there is depression. So depression is also a strategy. I say that because I've suffered from postnatal depression. I've had a nervous breakdown in my 20s and I didn't understand how a happy-go-lucky person who was into personal development, saturated in that environment, ended up depressed. So it was something that I really had to study and learn more about and understand the strategy so that I could flip and change that. Then when I mentioned that they're automatic habits, so I want you to all do a little exercise with me. I want you to all just lift one of your arms up. Very good. Now, do you think about all the muscles, nerves and tendons it takes to do that or it just happens automatically? That's how we operate every single day, okay? And so it just happens very quickly. Our behaviours also have positive and negative drivers. So an example I've got there is weight loss. So for me, when I got married 20 years ago, Prior to getting married for the engagement party, I wanted to lose 15 kilos. I tried to lose it, I didn't lose it, tried to do it on my own and I looked back at the photos and I was really disappointed. So I thought, okay, now I need some help because I want to look like the princess in the dress. So off I went and I joined what was called Easy Slim, which was like Weight Watchers. And because I could, you know, learn what to do, put myself in the environment, I thought, God, if I can do it, you can do it. So of course I became an instructor as well. <laughs> so I could help others, love helping people. However, when the wedding was over, I looked like the princess in the dress, I started to put the weight back on again. And it was like, why? Why am I doing this yo-yo that I've done for years? And that's because my driver was a negative one. I only wanted to lose weight, so I wasn't so-called fat on the wedding day. So it wasn't sustainable. Someone who has a positive driver, food is just fuel. They don't emotionally eat like I did. Exercise is like brushing their teeth. It's something that they just do naturally automatically. So when you change those drivers, you can sustain it. So my birthday's around Christmas time. I want to have a drink and eat and do whatever. Christmas, New Year. So I can put on a few kilos, but there's like a threshold that kicks in and I've never gone back to that 15 kilo blowout again. So good to note, people. So the other thing I've got there is emotional mastery is life mastery. It equals life mastery. Why? Because it teaches you how to respond versus react. So I could have freaked out really badly just then because my slideshow just went down. Or I could just breathe and stay calm and just know it's all good. Practice, okay? A lot of these things are practice. If they're a muscle, if you don't use them, you lose them. So being able to be in charge of your emotions versus them being in charge of you. So hopefully you've related to some of this so far. The next area we're going to look at today is capabilities. So capabilities are your skills and your skill sets. Now, something I hear a lot in coaching is when I grew up, my mum, my dad, this or that, what I want you to all know, and I'm sure you've heard a thousand times before, but I'm going to tell you again, your parents always did the best they could with the knowledge and skills they had at the time. We have different generations. There's a, there's a generational gap every, every time. So I'm sure if you relate to your kids now, it's very different to when you grew up. But we sometimes have expectations that people have the skills or skill sets or the capabilities to be able to do things, but the expectation, they may not have that. So also if you wanna upskill, well, this is an area so that you can be more capable. Also the skills and skill sets that you learn for life or life mastery, you don't learn them at school. So I've got an example there of communication. We role model that, okay? So it's not something that we're taught and that we go through. We're just copying and mimicking what it was that our parents did. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but my parents, they had arguments or discussions behind closed doors. So I didn't get a real representation of my mum having a backbone. So I didn't think she had a voice. So when I was in relationship, I didn't have a voice either. I had to learn that one. The other thing there is listening. Are you a good listener? Or are you thinking about what you wanna say next? There's that little monkey mind or the wise mind, but boy, it's very conversational. So do you wanna give your power to that? Or are you really present in the now, in the moment, listening to that person? It's a skill that you need to learn and develop. Then I've got your mind there is like a big computer, okay? And from the age of zero to seven is your imprint age and we'll go into those imprints. But science with the mindset has explained in the last probably 12 years, even though I've known this for about 25 years or more, 
that we actually operate 95% from our unconscious mind. There's only 5% that we're actually aware of. So you don't know what you don't know that you'll never know. And that's why your problems are never your real problems because 95% of the bus that is being driven by you, which is you, is operating from that unconscious, automatically, unconsciously, 95%. So if you're aware, like I'm quite self-aware, but how aware are we? Because there's only 5% that we have access to, right? So that's why the problems are never the real problems. When we look at your imprint age from zero to seven, your brain is just a sponge. The critical faculty hasn't developed. So everything just goes in. And then your brain stores all that information in little filing cabinets. You may as well press repeat on the photocopier because that's what it does. It just goes and lives that out. And we have memories that we get triggered or linked in and they associate and that's how we operate. But so when we're just a sponge, we can't reason. It's not until the age of seven that we start asking, but why, but why? But then from seven to 14 is your role modeling period. So it's who did you role model at that time? And you might've looked up to movie stars or um, actors, things like that, or it could be a favorite uncle. Then from 14 to 21 is your socialization period. So who did you hang around? Because you become what you hang around, who had influence over you. This also sets up programming in the mind. And then we've also got from 21 to 28, your first job, or your initiation into the workforce. So my brother who became a mechanic, his first initiation into the workforce was to have his head dunked down the toilet. Woohoo, little apprentice, here you go, you belong now. And that was like an SEE I've got there, a significant emotional event for him. It was like a bit of a trauma. So we have SEEs as well, which I'll go into, but all of these conditioning and programmings, you grow up as an adult with all of that. And then we wonder why we sound like our parents or we have mannerisms like them because all the programming is getting set and it's just hardwired in that 95%. Well, we, we now know that we can change it with neuroplasticity. And so then SEEs are a significant emotional event. So that's a trauma, like it could be a big trauma or a little trauma. So you can have things like a divorce or a death or a relocation or some kind of abuse. It could be physical, emotional, sexual. It could be a car accident, it could be being bullied. You know, we never know how we're going to interpret that experience, but again, it sets up all of this programming. And that's why you can't always explain the problem being the real problem, okay? Because we never know how that's going to affect someone. I had someone come in once where she was scared of the color red and it came back to a memory when she was playing hide and seek with an uncle. He had a red shirt on and he went boo and scared her and she had a phobia of the color red and that was actually a good experience it wasn't actually a bad one so interesting so basically we up, we accept the fact that we update our phones and our computers and our ipad and as a mindset specialist that's what i do with the brain i update the programming or install a new one so you get a different version you get a different result hopefully you find that interesting so next we're going to move on to beliefs Beliefs are thoughts you keep thinking over and over and over again. And there are possibility filters, okay? So they determine what is and isn't possible. So whether, you know, you feel like you should or shouldn't have money, um, with money, I just want you all for a minute just to think about what were the three main beliefs around money that your parents used to always say as you grew up? What were the three things that they would say about money? And if I share mine with you, my, I, I grew up in a home where beliefs around money were money's a root of all evil, money doesn't grow on trees, and money doesn't make you happy. But the lack of money didn't make them happy either because they stressed and they struggled. And so I had a real conflict around money, you know, when I was growing up. Then we've got relationships and parenting. We can have, we can come into a relationship together you can now start to see we can have a completely different program based on your upbringing. And then you come together and you wanna to manage money together. You wanna to parent children together. And we wanna be in relationship and live in the same house. And we wonder why we have conflict because we have completely different programs running, okay? And they're convictions that we hold to be true. We will argue for our limitations. We will argue for our belief systems and we won't see them as they're wrong. It's like, it's black and white. The sun rises, the sun sets. It's a conviction that we hold to be true. And that's what we believe and think about our belief systems. Now, this is the 5% that you're aware of. What about the 95% that you don't, but you'll argue for them anyway. <laughs> We're interested in human beings, that's for sure. So if I've got an example there. If you think that you are shy and you even have a belief where you just say that one out loud and you feel that you are shy, 
do you think that that's going to play a big part to how you operate in the world? Maybe you won't put yourself in certain environments because you feel that you're shy. It's going to affect how you behave. It may affect your capabilities and your skill sets. You may not put yourself in a leadership role because you're too shy. So it can really affect you. But if we flipped that where you were confident, can you imagine that you'd have a completely different path or choice? Then we've got beliefs become your experiences. And your experiences are a direct result of your belief system. So if there's something in life that you're not getting that you want, you'll have a whole set of unconscious belief systems supporting you, keeping you stuck, keeping you right where you are. This comes back to that two types of people and that boundary conditions. Like you might want to grow and evolve and expand. Your system doesn't want that because it thinks it's going to die. And that's why we physically can feel the oh, fight or flight kick in because it doesn't know what it looks like on the other side. So what we want to be able to do is change what those filtering systems are. Interesting. Hopefully you are resonating so far. All right. Oh, my goodness. We've hit this again. Let me go back one. Values. It worked. Thank goodness. <laughs> so values are your drivers, all right? They determine where you spend your time and where you spend your money. So someone will say, Linda, I can't afford coaching, yet their TV breaks down tomorrow. They'll find the money from somewhere. Why? Because they value that over investing in themselves. It's not one's right or wrong. It's just they're different. Or you might have a friend say, oh, you know, let's go do this or that. And they go, well, I can't. I've got no money. But the next minute they're going on a family holiday. It doesn't make sense because, well, it does to them because it's where what they determine is important, where they spend their time, where they spend their money. Okay. So if you find it important to buy a coffee every day or your lunch or cigarettes or gamble or drink, you'll find that money. And then people cry poor, but it's there. It's just they're spending it in and their time where they feel it's important. We're also meaning making machines, all right? So I've got there a boss and an employee. So I have a boss come in sometimes and I go, Linda, I'm paying all my staff more money, but they're still not happy. And it's like, well, maybe money isn't their driver. That does, that's not what speaks to them. You're talking a different language to them. So they might value a day off. They might value you telling them that you've done a good job. They might value a gift voucher. So it's just being on the same page and speaking the same language. The other thing is I have an employee come in and say, Linda, I'm doing everything right and I'm not earning the money that I want. And we elicit their values and money's not even on their list. So no wonder they're not getting it. Or if it is there, are there conflicts in the value system? For example, I've got to work hard to earn money. I'll say, well, Richard Branson earns a lot of money. He has a lot of fun and he does business in his board shorts. So is it possible that you can have fun and earn money? Yes, but it's looking at changing what those conflicts might be. Then we've also got relationships. So when it comes to relationships, looking at what are the relationship values. So my husband and I both value quality time, but quality time to him means being together and just sitting there and being. He likes to have his coffee, play his game on his iPad, and I want to talk. That's how I connect. That's what quality time means to me. So we have a completely different language. So there's compromise. There's times where we'll sit and just be and he'll have his coffee and play his iPad game and I'll journal or read a book and we enjoy each other's company. And then there's other times where, you know, I like to know what's going on in his world. I want to know and I connect through talking and drawing him out. So we'll be really engaged with each other in that regard too. So there's always compromise. So then we're going to move into the next one, which is identity. Identities are core beliefs, all right? And they are the place that we operate most of our lives from. And it is also where we self-sabotage. Now, of course, we wouldn't logically self-sabotage, but we do. This is because of the programming in the brain. So the example there I've got of money, because I grew up in a home where money was the root of all evil, money didn't grow on trees and money didn't make you happy, when I wanted to put all my prices up and I felt like I was doing everything right in my business, things just weren't flowing. And when we unpacked it with my coach, it meant if I was successful and had more money, it meant my dad wouldn't love me, which of course is not true. Of course, he would want that for me, but that was the belief based on I'd be evil and I wouldn't be happy. So you can see how, you know, things don't make logic sense, but when we unpack them, we can see the irony of them. And your, your system is really good at at um, wanting to do its job. So I wanna go into the identity in a little bit more detail. 
because the strongest force, I've got a quote there in the human personality, is the desire to protect one's sense of self and identity of who I am. It'll do anything to maintain that. And that's why you will self-sabotage. So you've got a core belief and this core belief, and then you've got all these other little bubbles, all these other unconscious belief systems supporting that construct and keeping it in place. Now, what happens in your system because it resists change is I go knock out some of these beliefs and your system goes and creates more because it wants to put you off. It only cares about longevity of life, not quality. It doesn't want you to change because it doesn't know what it's going to look like. So we've got to code it to be survivable so it can work smarter, not harder and transition that change. So now this is just an example of one belief in all of those five key areas. You could have multiple. People aren't robots. Everybody's different. Depends on how much work they've done as to how much you can break down. But the system's really good at being masterfully messed up and putting you off track and creating more. But when you knock, knock enough out, you destabilise that whole belief. So let me run through an example. If you've got a core belief there of I'm not good enough, and if it shows up in relationship, well, sorry, in self, it's I don't know enough. So if you at the core level, don't believe you're good enough, you could be thinking, well, I don't really know enough. And then in relationship could show up as I don't matter. Then it could show up with money as I can't earn enough. In business or career, it could show up as I don't know that. And then with your health, it could be I can't lose weight. Because if you're not good enough, everything else has that negative tone. But if we change that and we're able to change from the negative core belief to a positive one, where I am enough, then the self is, you know, I don't know, I'm constantly growing and learning. From I don't matter to I do matter. From I can't earn anything or I can earn anything that I want. From our business I don't know enough to I can't wait to find out. And from I can't lose weight to I'm working towards my ideal weight. So you can then see we can set up the unconscious belief systems to you know, serve the core belief of I am enough. Very interesting. Last but not least, we look at systemic. So systemic are like genetic patterns, all right? We accept the fact we have the same eye colour and hair colour. We do, we have patterns that get passed down through a family system and you can access like seven generations back. So it's just another level that I can look at if we're not making change in some of those areas. Maybe there's a family entanglement or some kind of pattern in the family system where you're carrying something that's not yours. The good news about that work is that when you change it in you, you change it down the line, okay? So it's our sense of belonging, our family, and it's where we, our number one human need is. Our number one human need is to belong so we feel safe and we feel loved and we'll do anything to stay in rapport with that family system. And that's why with me, if I stepped out and made money and my parents didn't, I was no longer in rapport with them. So I would self-sabotage to also come back to that. It drives our behaviours and certain actions. So let's say we have a family who's obese and one of the obese people step out of the family system and they decide they want to go and lose weight. And unconsciously, energetically, they turn on them and go, what are you doing? Have another cupcake. What are you trying to lose weight for? Because something doesn't feel right in the family system. So that person's got to either work twice as hard at the expense of relationships with their family unless you code it to be healthy and okay. Um, or they just give up, come back, it's too hard. We'll just belong to the family system again. So it's really quite interesting. Then I've got peer group pressure there. So when I talked about we wanna belong, let's say you've got a new job and everyone goes out for smoko and you don't normally smoke, but because you want to belong, you'll put yourself in that environment and you start taking up smoking, even though you know it's not healthy for you. So this is why we sometimes do things that don't serve us and we sort of can't really work out why, but it's because we want to belong and we're pack animals. We don't want to be alone. We want to do things together. And so particularly a family system is a massive hierarchy. And then there's also just in, in groups and things like that as well. So when you change the way that you look at things, the things you look at change. Wayne Dyer's quote, which I love, and what we say at Life Mastery Now is when you change, your whole world changes around you. So we want you to basically put on a new lens with new eyes for the first time and have a completely different experience. So when we come back to that life mastery success target, we've got those five key areas. Life mastery is all about managing and mastering your emotions, updating the programming in those five key areas so that you can master your life now. 
Remember, how you do one thing is how you do everything. I can have someone come in and have an issue in their business, but really it's because they've got a problem in their relationship. Work on the relationship, the business starts doing well again. So they all interact. If a piece is missing, it's no longer whole. So we want the balance. So knowing how to change the programming of your mind is both powerful and possible and is the key to life mastery now. So I'd like to thank you all for being here today and to showing up and listening. And I'd like to also offer you all a free one hour mastery discovery session where we can drill down on you as a person and what's going on in your world. And if you would like to do that, it's no obligation and you're more than welcome. I love, I'm in the job business of helping people and my mobile is there or my email, hello at lifemasterynow.com.au. So hopefully you've enjoyed that today and you've actually stretched outside the box. You can see some areas where you can be more adaptable and responsive to change and building a better you. Have a great rest of the day. Mm -hmm.